Okay, let's start. Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Adelina, computer scientist, and uh, together with Sherban Esari at Adobe, I will present today the topic called Hadoop as a Cassandra as a stable producer. Uh, let's go through the agenda. We will start with the problem that we have now with the current uh, architecture. After that, uh, we will describe our proposed solution and how we have implemented it. And uh, the presentation will end with our results and what we plan to do in the near future. First, I'll go to the problem that we had. We are both working in Adobe Audience Manager, a data management platform that collects data from various sources, builds audience profiles, and segments them. It's using a Lambda architecture with a Hadoop central database as a source of truth and Cassandra deployed on eight ages as a persistent cache system. There is a daily push of data from Hadoop to the edges and continuous push from the edges to Hadoop. All infrastructure is in AWS and for Cassandra we are using around 800 i3 to x large instances in 34 clusters. The problem that we have is the daily push from Hadoop to this is the current architecture of it. First, Hadoop output is uploaded to S3 and notifications are sent to SQS. In each edge region, there are several EC2 instances running two Java applications. The first consumes these SQS notifications, creates SS tables using SQL SS table writer, and sends SQS notification to the other application. It needs to do an aggregation on the table and on TTL, on the TTL because that's due to a limitation of SQL SS table writer, since the TTL must be specified in, in the instance statement and the writer has only one statement. The second application sends the S tables um, created previously to the Cassandra cluster with a capped throughput. All data is uh, kept on ephemeral disk until streamed. There were several advantages of this architecture com compared with batch instance. The streaming should be more efficient than that, and throughput is easier to control, allowing us to send more data when the daily traffic is lower. But it's more interesting to look at these advantages. In practice, the SS table writer will start slowly, accumulate data before being able to pass it to, for streaming, and uh, sometimes not being able to produce enough data to fill the throughput cap, as you can see in the graph. Then it will fill the disk due to SS table loader variation, the throughput cap. And you can see in the lower graphic uh, uh, how it uh, uh, stops and starts when disks become available, filling it back to 100%. All this, uh, all this disk activity makes the service faithful. If we lose one instance, we have to choose between re uh, restarting the entire process for all, for the entire cluster from zero, or assuming or uh, accepting that we lost some data. It's also inefficient. It's uh, disk and CPU intensive while running, but only until it fills the disk. Then the disk and CPU are underutilized. Some, or on the other hand, sometimes they are not enough. When the TTL cardinal is uh, larger than the usual, it will need more compute resources. You can see in the graph here that there are long pauses between usages. For some clusters, the data push is not daily or is big, resulting in EC2 instances that are not used for 80% of the time. 
Also, it will distribute the data uniformly across the entire cluster. Each SS table will have data for all instances because it will not create hotspots. But on the other hand, it will create small SS tables on each Cassandra node, especially for, for large clusters, since we have the same SS table size divided by, let's say, 100 nodes. All these small SS tables will then be compacted with SPSS on L0. Some time ago, I investigated this, and it's about uh, between 15 and 20 percent of the total number of compaction. That is the normal LCS uh, compactions between levels. Thus, streaming and compaction becomes the main reason for scaling out for some clusters, uh, simply to have enough compute resources for compaction. Overall, however, there was little need to, to change this architecture. There were little gains available. The only tangible benefit would have been to decouple the two applications and make it stateless. And while that would have been nice from an operational perspective, it wouldn't have improved Cassandra performance at all. And that was true until uh, screen changes were announced in Cassandra 4. I won't get into details about this, Uh, but um, there are there is there are two blog posts and at least one uh, presentation about it. By using uh, zero copy streaming, it becomes five times faster and should have less impact on Cassandra nodes' performance. It relies on copying the entire SS table to the destination servers, and in order for this to work, the SS table data must belong to a single token range just like they are on Cassandra nodes. So we started, we started to think about a new architecture. The new architecture implies moving the SS table writer from the edge AC2 instances to a new Hadoop MapReduce job. Hadoop is a much better tool for aggregation and in order to produce token aware SS tables, we need more partitioning and, and aggregation. This could have been done also in the older architecture, but it would have amplified a slow start and inefficiency. And in some ways, we would have implemented something like Hadoop. Uh, let's look at the simplified schema of the previous and current uh, Hadoop MapReduce component from the pipeline. We're having a Spark application which produces files in HDFS. Uh, those files are representing the input of the MapReduce job, which will be, which will upload the data in S3 in JSON format. For each file uploaded in S3, an SQS notification is sent. The first part of the schema remains unchanged, using the same files produced by uh, the Spark application in HDFS. A new MapReduce job will be generating directly the token aware SS tables in S3. This MapReduce job can be executed by using our Cloudera cluster or by using a separate EMR cluster. Again, for each file uploaded to S3, we will have an SQS notification. But uh, each SS table has uh, eight files. So for ensuring that we have a single SQS notification for each SS table, we are archiving the files corresponding to an SS table under a single tar file. The bulk loader is now uh, just one Java application, which is streaming data from S3 and SQS. The solution has uh, less SQS uh, queues in tools, no, no more SS table writer, producer, and consumer to manage. Since it's stateless, it's much easier to be deployed in Kubernetes uh, with uh, containers started, started only when SQS notifications needs to be processed, making it more cost efficient. We are also hoping to see other performance improvements in Cassandra. Streaming should now produce normal, that is 256 megabytes as a stable, instead of small ones. So it should be less SPSS on L0. And uh, also we'll have uh, better control. We'll be able to delay streaming to specific instances. 
such as notes that are down or are being decommissioned. Regarding these ones, uh, we are uh, constantly seeing a bug on one of the large cluster. If we decommission during streaming, the bloom filters are no longer working properly, making one or more nodes very slow. And the only reliable solution that I found is to replace the nodes. I don't have more information about this since it's very difficult to reproduce and uh, it only happens on the largest cluster. There are some question marks in the new architecture. Uh, to partition by a token range in Hadoop, we must have the, this information, the token distribution data from all clusters. Also, what happens when a cluster is scaled in or out? That would make the token distribution data only partially correct. On scale-in, the SS table being streamed will still belong to a single token range, actually to a sub-range, since what will happen is that some token ranges will just be consolidated in a larger one. But on scale out, it will not, since token ranges will be split. But that only means that we'll fall back to old style streaming to the new nodes and to those that had uh, that data. That's not ideal, but it's not a disaster either. And it will be impacting only a few instances and only on uh, limited occasions. So let's discuss the implementation. The Hadoop job needs to create SS tables for eight different clusters, some of them Cassandra 3, some Cassandra 4, because we will we'll not be able to upgrade all eight clusters at the same time to Cassandra 4. On Cassandra 3, it's also not, probably not a good idea to stream these token-aware SS tables, since we'll stream from more than one container. It's just a matter of time until several containers will stream to the same Cassandra node, result, resulting in hotspots. At this moment, there is no way to control this on the destination, no cap on incoming streaming. But as far as I remember, there is an open Jira ticket for this. But that will be in Cassandra 4 anyway, so it's, uh, it's not really an issue. For, for getting the token range information, we will use the Prometheus metrics, which are already consolidated in Thanos in the same AWS region with the Hadoop cluster. To generate token-aware SS tables, we need to ensure that uh, reducer tasks are getting only data belonging to the same token range. For this, we're using Hadoop partitioning, which controls which reducer will get each record outputted by the map jobs. Usually, this is a hash function, but uh, in our case, it's just a map converting token values to a partition index. To ensure uh, uniformity, this must be deterministic. There must be no variation in how this is computing, since, since it will be executed at different times from different map tasks. The partitioning is also useful for Cassandra tree clusters, since the number of tokens in each cluster should be a good enough approximation of the cluster size, thus keeping Hadoop reducers balanced. Currently, in our solution, the range of partition is equal to the number of token ranges. For Cassandra 3, each record is sent to a random partition within the interval, thus eliminating hotspots. For Cassandra 4, all the records belonging to a token range will have the same partition. In the future, for increasing performance, we can further divide the records from a token range to more than one partition. Uh, there are several Hadoop classes uh, that we customize. I'll go through the most important ones. First, uh, custom mapper. By definition, a mapper gets as input key value pairs and outputs a set of intermediate key value pairs. In our case, it will pre compute partitioning data structure and on each map set the partition index. It knows which region has Cassandra 3 or 4. 
The partitioner uh, usually contains a hash function which ensures that the data is uniformly distributed between tasks. In our case, it is a very simple class which contains a method to get the partition index set during the map phase. The custom record writer usually just writes the output key value pairs to an output, output file. In our case, this is where SS tables are being created. It manages a map of string and SQL SS table writer instance, since we can still get distinct TTLs in each run. Each writer instance gets its unique folder to write to. It overrides two methods, write to send data to the proper writer, and close to close all writer instances, car each SS table, and upload them to S3. All this looks great now, but we had a lot of problems. Uh, the traditional Hadoop model, at least how it's used in Adobe Audience Manager and how I understand it, is that the input is split in multiple parts and each reducer outputs. There is no conflict even when one computer is running multiple reducers at the same time even if they are using the same output folder because the files are different. On the other hand, Cassandra Writer is very sensitive to having two writers using the same folder. This triggered multiple bugs, which were easily solved when I changed this to use unique temporary output folders. But to get to this point, I need to understand both Cassandra and Hadoop behaviors. Another issue, a very difficult one was usage of Vice writable class. It's one of the classes that implements the writable interface in order to allow, allow Hadoop to serialize, deserialize basic data types. In custom record writer, we need to get the byte array out of a byte writable instance in order to send it to the Cassandra writer. And uh, the get bytes is perfect. However, as uh, others have seen before, get bytes returns a zero padded bytes array since it's actually returning a reference to the underlying uh, data structure, not to the data that was sent to it. I should say that uh, the title of this uh, Hadoop Jira ticket that I included here is entirely appropriate. It's a very bad name that leads to mistakes. So in our case, it was adding 50% of zeros to any byte array. This in turn triggered another issue, a problem in the SQL SS table writer, which added the, the same record multiple times in the same SS table using the same partition key. And that made, which of course made the SS table invalid and triggered an error on streaming. And it was almost impossible to diagnose, as it was the last place to look at. I was assuming that there is a, a problem with uh, the map phase, that we are somehow duplicating records, anything but looking at this issue. At some point, I noticed the zeros, but I, I assumed it was a Hadoop parsing issues on the testing environment. And uh, since the duplicate keys was, was a much more critical issue, it, and the, and the, the padded zero seem totally unrelated. So I only discovered this when I noticed that the padding was always 50% of the length of the data length, of the original data length, and started to investigate this strange thing while being blocked on the other issue. The solution was very simple and it's well known in the Hadoop community to replace get bytes with copy bytes. And that immediately solved, to, our, to my amazement, the uh, duplicate record problem. There were also multiple problems due to partitioning differences between, uh, between con uh, with the Cloud Direct controller and reducers. It was time consuming, but easy to solve by ensuring we have the same configuration files use as a stable sort we use stable sorting and be very careful with panels out parsing 
since any error there will compromise the entire job. Next problem, the Java dependencies hell. We had to combine our legacy Hadoop code with Cassandra, and initially there was no problem in the job that we were testing. But when we try the full run of all Hadoop jobs, our uh, daily pipeline, we got a Guava version conflict. Upgrading the version in our code was not an option. It would have touched too much code. The solution was to build a fat jar version of Cassandra that included all libraries with Guava shaded in order to sidestep the version conflict. And I should mention that I was able to do this only with the help of the Cassandra fork that uses Gradle instead of Ant. I don't really know any of them, Gradle of Ant, but Gradle is more accessible, at least for me. There were also problems with other jars, and we had to exclude several other libraries and uh, shade the native jar too. And I think uh, that once the Gradle support gets into Cassandra trunk, it should be easier to build Cassandra as a fat jar with shaded jars. So let's look at what were the results. The goal that we started with was to compare two clusters receiving production traffic, one with Cassandra 3 and the old streaming, and the secondary one with Cassandra 4 and the new streaming. And perhaps to have Cassandra 4 then on both of them to compare the difference on the streaming impact between uh, as a stable aware and, uh, and not aware. We didn't get there due to delays while solving the above problems and more. The last problem we had was a recent uh, Cassandra Jira ticket. It's uh, one week old now. And it prevented the, the bulk load application to connect to Cassandra 4 cluster for streaming. When we'll, when we'll be ready with that and other problems, we'll try to push to publish the results on the Adobe test blog, the comparison. But uh, what we have tested and verified is that zero copy streaming works with Hadoop generated SS table. And uh, here is the log that uh, proves it. The log is from uh, the server that received data streamed with the uh, SS table loader. And you can see it using the new class, big table zero copy writer. And we also found, found a minor bug in the SS table loader. I didn't, we didn't, I didn't report it yet. It's, um, it will report errors in uh, the uh, above situation for all nodes that are not getting data, which will be most of, most of the nodes. But the streaming does work on the nodes that have the token. Now, the plans for the future. Um, on Hadoop side, we might look into read and write directly on S3. Since we have plans to drop Cloudera and HDFS, moving to an S3 backed file system. This might be very difficult as it will require changes in how SQL SS table writer works. We might keep using the EMR HDFS instead. As I was previously mentioning, block or delay some uh, streaming to some specific host or token ranges should be quite easy. Well, we should investigate that as a stable error. It should be simple as well. Uh, on a longer term, it will be interesting to see if we can offline merge and then split all as a stable belong to the same token range before streaming, sort of doing an offline compaction. I expect this to further decrease the compaction pressure. And that's all. Before finishing, I should add that this was a team effort. Started as, it started as a garage week project, then a dissertation thesis of a former colleague, Lavinia Serbu, then a project for an intern, Laura Dumitrel. It couldn't be finished before the end of her internship due to limited involvement from Adelina and me. Questions?
no questions. Oh, thank you. We finished a bit earlier, but I don't think anyone will be upset because of that. For uh, any questions, you, have the, uh, you can always reach us on our emails included at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks.